This is the 11th video in our series on abstract algebra, and today we're going to talk about a very important type of group known as a quotient group. But in order to get there, I'd like to motivate the situation. Maybe recall that before we talked about cosets and exactly what those were, and we did lots of examples. So we're taking an assumption of familiarity with cosets here. Okay, so here's our leading question. Given a group G and a subgroup, which we'll call H, what are the conditions that the set of all left cosets forms a group? And well, if it forms a group, that means we need an operation. And I'd say the obvious operation would be the following. So we have the coset XH times the coset YH is defined to be the coset associated to X times YH. And let's notice for free, we've got these facts here. We've got an identity element with this operation. It's just the identity coset or the subgroup itself. We have an inverse, and so the inverse of the coset GH will be the coset connected to G inverse. And we also have associativity, which is inherited from the group. But wait, that seems like everything we need in order to define a group. So are we good to go here? Is this like something that can work with any subgroup? Well, in fact, we're not good to go because under cover of everything, this operation may not be well-defined. Here, this operation may, like I said, not be well-defined. And what do I really mean by that? Well, let's recall when we're talking about cosets, cosets have possibly many different representatives. So XH might also have the representative A. So XH could be equal to, for instance, AH. And then YH could have a representative, for instance, B. So that would also be the coset BH. And we wanna make sure that this operation we're defining does not depend on the coset representative that we're choosing to make this you know, operation. And I'd like to give an example of where we run into a problem with this. And then after that, we'll work out the characteristic that the original subgroup must have so that this is a well-defined operation. Okay, so let's start with S3. So that's our symmetric group on three letters. And then we'll take H to be the two cycle or the transposition one, two, generating a cyclic subgroup. So that's got order two, which means our cyclic subgroup is just the identity and then one, two. And now let's look at a couple of cosets. Let's look at the coset connected to two, three. So we'll look at two, three, H. Well, let's notice that that's gonna be two, three times each of these elements of H, but we already talked about how to combine cycles. So I'll just write this down. So this will be two, three. That's what we get from combining two, three with the identity. And then combining two, three with one, two, three will give us one, three, two. But then let's recall that we can take any element of the coset to serve as its coset representative. So let's also take one, three, two, H. So that means here we've got two different ways of writing this one coset with two different representatives. We have 2, 3, H and we have 1, 3, 2, H. And now let's play this game again. Let's look at the coset associated to 1, 3. So that's going to be 1, 3. That's what we get from multiplying 1, 3 into the identity. And then we'll have the 3 cycle, 1, 2, 3. That's what we get from multiplying 1, 3 into 1, 2. Okay, but again, the coset can have a representative, which is any element of that coset. So we could rewrite this as the coset associated to 1, 2, 3. That was from that big theorem, I think, two videos ago. Okay, so here we've got the setup that we need. We've got two distinct cosets, and these two distinct cosets are written with two representatives each. And now what we'll try to do is do the product of these two cosets two different ways and see if we get the same thing. 
Okay, so let's maybe first do the product using these two cycle representatives. So in other words, we wanna look at this. So two three H times one three H, trying to use our definition of our operation over here. So that should be equal to the two three one three H, again by our operation definition over here, but the product of those two two cycles will give us one two three. So we have one two three H. Okay, nice. But now hopefully that's gonna be the same thing as multiplying it with these two representatives. But of course it's not going to be just based off the fact that we're going for an example where this is not well-defined. Okay, so let's what, take 1, 3, 2, H and multiply it into 1, 2, 3, H. But let's notice that that's going to be 132 times 123H. So let's write that 132123H. But that's exactly equal to the identity. Those are inverses of each other. So this gives us the identity times H or just H. But now we could write these out as sets if we wanted to. Maybe we will do that just to like drive this home. So this thing is equal to the set, let's see, one, three, and one, two, three. Just by our calculation that we did up here. But H is the set one and one, two from our original setup but I think it's pretty clear that these are not the same set. And so since these are not the same set, this operation is not well defined. And I remember like learning a course like this for the first time and I was always really confused about like how to check something's well defined or why we need to check something is well defined. But maybe the best way to think about it is if an object in a set has two different names, but it's the same thing, but it has two different names, then you have to check if whatever you're doing to that set is a well-defined operation. And that's exactly what's happening here. So we've got two, three, H and one, three, two, H are the same object, but they have two different names, two, three, and one, three, two. And similarly, one, three, H and one, two, three, H are the same object, but they have two different names, one, three, and one, two, three. And so if our operation is well-defined, it doesn't matter which name we pick to perform the operation. We get the same result. But that's not what happened here. The result of our calculation was dependent on which name we chose for each object. But that means this operation is not well-defined. And so that tells us that over here, there must be some sort of restriction on this subgroup H if we wanna end up with a group of cosets. Now what I'd like to do is a little bit of a calculation to figure out what that restriction is. So after all of that discussion we've just done, we come up with the following question. And that is what rule or rules must H satisfy so that this operation which I'm calling magenta star is a well-defined operation? Okay, well, so what does that really mean? That means we need the following. For all A, B, C, D in G, such that A, H is the same thing as C, H, and B, H is the same thing as D, H, then we have A, B, H is the same thing as C, D, H. Okay, so that's exactly what we need for it to be well-defined. So here we've got a coset and it has two different names, AH and CH. And here we have a coset and it has two different names, BH and DH. And we wanna show that multiplying this coset with this coset does not depend on the name we choose. And that's what is exhibited by this equation right here. Okay, so now let's get going. 
So let's see some things that we know just based off of the equality of these cosets. Let's notice, for instance, that we have C A inverse is an element of H. So that follows immediately from A H being equal to C H. Okay, but then we also have B D inverse is also an element of H. That's because B H is equal to D H. And then furthermore, since these two cosets are the same, we have AB times CD quantity inverse is an element of H. So that's what we have. We have those three facts based off of the equality of those cosets. And this is actually equivalent to the equality of those cosets by that big theorem that we proved two videos, I believe, ago. So now what we'll do is expand this out using the shoes and socks theorem. So this means that A, B, D inverse, C inverse is an element of H. But now let's notice that we've got B, D inverse right here as an element of H, and we've got B, D inverse right here. So this gives us some motivation to write B times D inverse as a little h in H. That'll just help the calculation. And now let's notice we have the following. So this is an element of H, this A, B, D inverse, C inverse by this line right here. But then we'll rewrite this B, D inverse as H. So that gives us A times H times C inverse. Okay, but where can we go from here? Well, we can do this. Let's take this quantity right here and notice that this is exactly the same thing as saying that A C inverse is equal to maybe something that I'll call H prime. So that's an element of H. But now we can solve this for C fairly easily. Notice that C will be equal to H prime times A. But now let's put that value of C in here and see what we have. We have a h, and then we'll have h prime times a, all of that inverse. But now we can apply the inverse rule to this last term, which is in parentheses, giving us a h, a inverse, and then we'll have h prime inverse. And let's just bring this as an element of h over. But now we've got an element of H right here, just because H is closed under taking inverses. And then we're multiplying this into an element of H to give us H. But that means that stuff in the green parentheses must also be an element of H. So we have A H, A inverse is an element of H. And that's actually the condition that we wanna get at. So notice that this A was like, pretty much chosen arbitrarily. And also we could tweak the other choices of let's see B and D to produce like any value of H as well. So that means something like this must hold for all A in the group and then for all H in the subgroup. And so that's our condition. So it may seem like a strange condition, but this is the condition that we'll, we'll want. Okay, so now let's write that up as a definition and see what we get out of that. Now we're ready for our proper definition. So given a group G and a subgroup N, we say that that subgroup is a normal subgroup and we'll write, well, I read this as N is a normal subgroup, but you've got this little closed triangle here. If for all little g and g and little n and N, we have G N G inverse is an element of N. So in other words, this subgroup is closed under a certain conjugation action. So this is called conjugation by the element G. Now I'd like to point out that I won't prove this, but this is equivalent to the following two statements. And these make good homework exercises. So the left coset GN is the same thing as the right coset NG. So if you recall from previous videos, this is not generally true. And then this object GNG inverse is equal to N.
And so this is some sort of double coset, but you can think about what this is. This is everything of the form g little n, g inverse, as little n ranges through all elements of n. So it's a set. Okay, so in this case, we can form something called the quotient group. And here I'm introducing some notation inside of the definition. This is g by n, or maybe I would read that as g mod n actually. And that's the set of all left cosets. So that's what we have here. And then the operation is that operation we discussed on the previous board, where if you combine xn with yn, you should get xyn. Now here's a nice theorem that ties all of this together, and that is if we've got a group G, N is a normal subgroup if and only if G mod N itself is a group. So let's notice the reverse direction here is exactly that exploration that we did in the previous uh, chalkboard. Maybe you could clean that up a little bit to make it a little less exploratory, but that's the basic idea. So the forward direction, all we need to do is check that the operation is well defined by our previous discussion of how we kind of automatically have an identity inverses and also associativity. So let's check that this operation is well defined. Okay, so let's suppose that N is a subgroup of G and we also have, or I should say a normal subgroup of G, and we have AN is the same thing as BN, and then CN is the same thing as DN, as cosets. I guess I should say for A, B, C, D, which are group elements. Okay, so now let's get to it. So we'll have AN times CN is defined to be ACN, but we'd like to show that that's the same thing as BN times DN. That would show that this thing is well defined. But now let's notice if AN is equal to BN, then that means that A is an element of the coset BN, which means that A is equal to little b times N1, for N1 inside of the normal subgroup. And then similarly, we have C is equal to D times little n2 for little n2 inside of the subgroup. Okay, and then that's exactly what we're gonna do. We're going to replace A and C with B times N1 and D times N2. So let's do that. So we have B times N1 and then D times N2, then normal subgroup like that. But now next up, let's also notice that N1 times D is an element of the right coset ND. Oh, but the right coset ND is exactly the same thing as the left coset DN. But this thing N1D being an element of that left coset means that N1D is in fact equal to D times N1 prime. So we don't exactly get commutativity here. What we get is commutativity by a different element, if you will. Okay, so now that means I'm gonna replace N1D with DN1 prime. So now we have this is B times D times N1 prime times N2 times this N right here. But now let's notice that these are both elements of that subgroup N, which means we can essentially just absorb them into that subgroup N, and that leaves us exactly where we wanna be with the coset BDN, which by the definition of our operation is BN times DN. But that's exactly where we wanted to end up. We showed that this operation does not depend on the name that you choose for the element. Okay, so now let's start with some examples. In order to set up our first examples, let's look at the following observation, which says that all subgroups of abelian groups are normal. And this is pretty clear just because we've got commutativity here. So the G and the G inverse will cancel, but let's maybe write it down just to be sure. So let's take an arbitrary G inside of G and an arbitrary N inside of N, where I haven't written my setup, but the setup is that G is a group and N is a subgroup. It may not be a normal subgroup though. Okay, and now let's note 
that g times little n times g inverse is the same thing as g times g inverse times little n, but that's equal to the identity times little n, which is little n, which is inside of n. And this step right here, I use the commutativity, which in general we don't have. We only have that for abelian groups. Okay, so now that we've got this observation ready, let's look at some first examples. Okay, so let's look at a nice first example. So let's take the cyclic subgroup generated by three inside of the integers. But let's recall that that is sometimes written as three times z. That's just gonna be all multiples of three. We've got the integers with addition here. So because we're in an abelian setting, we know that this is a normal subgroup. Now let's quickly look at the cosets. So we've got the coset, which is the subgroup itself, 3z. So that's all multiples of three. We've got the coset attached to one, so one plus 3z. Recall our operation is addition here, so that's how we'll write the cosets. And so that's gonna contain everything from this plus one, so minus five, minus two, one, four, seven, and so on and so forth. And then we've got the coset two plus three z, which will be built similarly. We have minus four, minus one, two, five, eight, so on and so forth. And now let's notice that these three sets partition the integers, but since they partition the integers, we know that we have all of the cosets. So there are three cosets. So that means we've got a group with three elements. And we know that we have a group because this is normal. We know that there are three elements because this group is made up of the cosets and there are three cosets. So as a set, our quotient group is exactly these cosets. I'll write it as zero plus three Z, one plus three Z, and two plus three Z. But let's notice that this is a group with three elements. But earlier we proved that any group with p elements was cyclic and thus it was isomorphic to zp. So that means we very, very quickly get that this is isomorphic to z3 in this case. Now, if you wanted to, you could do some calculations and set up some sort of explicit isomorphism, but perhaps we won't do that. We will do some side calculations to get a feel for what's going on here though. Let's notice that one plus three Z plus two plus three Z under our operation is three plus three Z. But since three is an element of three Z, this is the same thing as the coset three Z, which is the coset zero plus three Z. So that means one plus three Z and two plus three Z are additive inverses here. And then let's also do maybe two plus three Z plus two plus three Z, and note that that's equal to four plus three Z by the definition of our operation. But since four is an element of one plus three Z, we know that must be equal to the coset one plus three Z by coset equality theorem from before. So those are some sample calculations, but like I said, because this is a three element group, we know it must be equal to Z three. Now there's something much more general happening here, which will be like maybe a nice homework exercise. And that is if you take Z mod N Z, you get exactly Z N. And this isn't quite as like crazy as it might look because all you have to do is show that this left hand side is a cyclic group. So in fact, Z mod N Z, is cyclic and it's generated by the coset one plus nz. But then since it's cyclic, we're very close to showing that it's this cyclic group. Okay, let's do another. For our next example, let's think about the group z10 and take the cyclic subgroup generated by six. So since everything is abelian here, we know that this is normal, but let's calculate six as a set. Okay, so we'll have zero, we'll have six, we'll have six plus six, which is 12, but 12 is two in Z10. Six plus six plus six is 18, but that's eight in Z10. Four sixes give us 24, but that's four in Z10. And then five sixes give us 30, but that's back to zero in Z10. But let's notice that's the same thing as the cyclic group generated by the number two. 
Okay, so now let's calculate some cosets. Notice that we've got the coset zero plus two. Well, that's just gonna be the set itself, zero, two, four, six, eight. Recall, everything is happening mod 10 here, that's our parent group. And then we'll have one more coset, one plus the subgroup generated by two. That'll give us one, three, five, seven, nine. But notice we've partitioned Z10 here. So since we've partitioned Z10, we know that these are the only two cosets. But that means that we have as a set, Z10 mod the cyclic subgroup generated by two is simply the coset zero plus two and the coset one plus two. It has those two single elements but there's only a single group of order two because two is prime and that's Z2. So we know that this is in fact isomorphic to Z2. And we could easily check some operations if we wanted to. Notice if we do one plus the cyclic subgroup generated by two plus one plus the cyclic subgroup generated by two, we get two plus the cyclic subgroup generated by two but two is inside that cyclic subgroup. So that means that's the same thing as zero plus the cyclic subgroup generated by two. So we have one plus one, which is zero, but that's exactly the kind of thing that happens in Z2 anyway. All right, now let's look at some non-abelian examples. So before we get started with our non-abelian examples, let's look at a, a remark, which we won't prove, but I think it's fairly straightforward to prove. And that is to show that N is a normal subgroup of G, we only need to show that this holds G, N, G, N versus an element of N for all generators, little g, n, g, and little n, n, n. And I put only here in quotes because for lots of groups, it's not clear what the generators are. Like for example, with S, N, this would not be the way to do it. This would be a huge headache. But for dihedral groups, which form like a nice set of examples for our purposes of first understanding quotient groups, this helps us out quite a bit because we know exactly the generators of dihedral groups. Okay, so let's start with our first example, which will be the start of a couple of examples with normal subgroups of D4, the symmetries of a square. So let's take the cyclic subgroup generated by R, so that's going to be all of the rotations. And let's notice just the generators of D4 are S and R, and we know that S squared is equal to the identity, R to the fourth, fourth is equal to the identity, and then we've got some commutation relations as well that we proved in previous videos. Then the generator of the cyclic subgroup R is just simply R. Okay, so now what we need to do is show that this kind of thing holds for those generators. So let's first maybe pick S because that's the one outside of R. And then the one inside of R, well, that's pretty obvious that this thing is gonna hold. Okay, so, but anyway, let's notice if we do S, R, S inverse. So that's picking this generator of D4 and this generator of R. That's the same thing as S, R, S, given that S is its own inverse. But then that's the same thing as S times S times R cubed. That's by the commutation rule with R and S. But S times S is the identity. It's its, it, it is its own inverse. And so we're just left with R cubed, which is clearly in the cyclic subgroup generated by R. So notice we don't land on the same element, but we do land on an element with, which is within R. And now let's notice to do the other one, it's really trivial because this generator is already inside of our subgroup. We have R, R, R inverse is equal to R, which is clearly in there. So now we know that we have a normal subgroup and we also know some other things. So this isn't a trick that I used uh, previous examples today, but it's an important one to know. Notice that the order of D4 is eight. The order of R is four. That's because as an element has order four, so as a cyclic subgroup, that has order four as well. And then we also know that the index of 
this group in D4 is equal to this quotient. So it'll be equal to eight over four, which is equal to two. So that means we know we expect to have two cosets, or in other words, that's the same thing as the order of the quotient group. So this is a nice way of calculating the order of the quotient group, which is the order of the group divided by the order of the subgroup. So that seems like something that should happen. Okay, but that being said, it's fairly straightforward to write out the elements of the quotient group. So let's do that. So you have the identity element, so that'll be the identity and our subgroup, and then you'll have S with R. So all you have to do is pick one element outside of this subgroup and you know that you've found everything. Well, let's write these down. Notice that the identity on R is just equal to E R R squared and R cubed, whereas S R is equal to S S R S R squared and S R cubed. So it breaks down into the number of rotations or the rotations and the reflections. Now let's introduce some notation that'll just simplify our calculations. Notice that here we could write this as E bar and here we could write this as S bar. And notice we could make a Cayley table pretty easily. So E bar, S bar, E bar, S bar. Notice multiplying by the identity clearly doesn't change anything. And then if we combine S bar with S bar, we get E bar. And that's because, notice that S bar times S bar is equal to S squared times our subgroup R, but S squared is the identity, so this is E R. So we get something like that. But notice this is exactly Z2. I guess we could have argued that since it has two elements, it's isomorphic to Z2, but that's kind of neither here nor there. So like I said, this is isomorphic to Z2. But I think there's a really nice visual way to think about this, just by taking a square. So let's take a square. Let's recall that D4 was the symmetries of this whole square. And let's manipulate this square so that its only symmetry left is a reflection, which is essentially what happened after we formed this quotient group. We were only left with this reflection. Well, I think there's probably a number of ways to do this, but let's maybe put a dot right here and a dot right here and a dot right here and then connect these. So if we can connect these into this kind of shape, notice we only have a single symmetry left and that single symmetry left is reflection about this axis. So I would say that this D4 mod R really represents the symmetry of this square that's been changed to maybe break apart some of its symmetries and get rid of them. Maybe it's also important to point out that this is the same thing as D1. So there's a dihedral group D1, which is of order two, and that's thought of as the symmetry group of something with only bilateral symmetry, which is exactly what we have right here. Okay, let's do a couple more examples with D4. So for our next example, let's look at this subgroup, which I'll call N, which is generated by S and R squared. And we'll show first that this is normal inside of D4. And we'll use the same kind of thing that we did before with generators on both sides. So the generators of N are S and R squared, whereas the generators of D4 are R and S. Well, notice there's a single generator of D4 that's not a generator of N, and that generator is R. So notice we could write D4 as generated by S and R, just to like keep this rolling. So that means we really only need to check the normal subgroup rule for this extra generator R. So let's do that. So let's notice that R, S, R inverse will hopefully be inside of this group. Another thing to point out is that this is really the only thing we need to check because R commutes with the generator R squared. So that means you clearly stay within the normal subgroup. Okay, so anyway, let's get to it. So this is equal to R, S, R to the third power, that's because R inverse is R to the third power. But now that's gonna be equal to S times R cubed times R cubed by the commutation rule of R with S. 
but now that's gonna be equal to s times r to the six, which is s times r squared, which is clearly inside of n. It's the product of the two generators of n. Okay, so now let's write n out, and we'll, then we'll write its coset out as well. So notice the subgroup n is e r squared s and then s r squared. So that's what we get out of that. You can check that that is a subgroup. And then we have r n, which is the only other coset just by the fact that we've got four elements here. So we expect exactly two cosets. This will be r r cubed, um, s r and then s r cubed. Great, so again, that's just multiplying everything by r. Okay, so now we could introduce some more notation. Let's say that this is equal to e bar and this is equal to r bar, and we could do the same sort of calculation. So e bar, r bar, e bar, r bar. Notice here we'll have e bar, r bar, r bar, multiplying by the identity, but then combining r bar with itself, we will get e bar. And why is that? That's because Rn times Rn is exactly equal to R squared N, but since R squared is an element of N, this is the same thing as En. So that establishes this like R bar times R bar is equal to E bar. Okay, so this is maybe a nice description of D4 mod N in this case. So these are the elements of D4 mod N, these two cosets, this is the multiplication table, and this is just a check of one of the calculations. Now, similar to what we saw before, this should probably be able to be described as the group of symmetries of a square, well, a tweaked square. A tweaked square where we kill some of the symmetries. So before we killed the symmetry, so we only kept bilateral symmetry. That's because after taking the quotient, we were only left with a reflection. But now we wanna kill the symmetry so we have a rotational symmetry. But a rotational symmetry that squares to the identity, and so that would need to be a 90 degree rotational symmetry. So how could we do that? Well, I think there's probably a lot of different ways to change this square around so it only has a 90 degree rotational symmetry, but maybe something like this is nice. Let's put two circles up here and we'll put two circles down here. And now notice with the addition of those two circles, the only symmetry that's left here is that rotational symmetry by 180 degrees, which is represented by this R bar inside of the quotient group. Okay, so let's do one more example inside of D4. So for our next example, we'll look at R squared. Well, the cyclic subgroup generated by R squared inside of D4. So that's a normal subgroup. Let's check that it's a normal subgroup. Notice using this same fact up here, we only need to check that this rule holds for the generator S. And that's because the additional generator R inside of D4 commutes with a power of itself. So there's really nothing to do there. So let's do that. So let's calculate S R squared S inverse. But notice that's the same thing as S R squared S given that S is its own inverse. But now commuting, we'll get S squared r to the four minus two using like the commutation rules of r with s, but now s squared is the identity and four minus two is clearly equal to two. So that means we land back in our group. And like I said, that's the only thing we need to check. And now let's also notice that the size of d4 mod this group will be equal to eight over two. And that's because this cyclic subgroup generated by r squared only contains two elements, e and r squared. But eight over two is equal to four, so that means we'll have four cosets. So let's write them down. Let's use similar notation to what we did before. Let's take this identity coset just to be equal to E bar. And now let's start with the one associated to R. So we've got the coset R in the cyclic subgroup R squared. So that's gonna give us R and R cubed. Maybe we'll call that R bar. 
And then let's do the same thing with S. So we'll have S into the cyclic subgroup. So that's gonna give us S, SR squared. We'll call that S bar. And then we'll have SR finally into this cyclic subgroup. So that's going to leave us with the coset SR and SR cubed. Maybe we would call this SR bar. So we've got four elements there. Now let's also notice that we have commutativity. And maybe we could fit that in over here. Notice that we have SR squared times RS squared is equal to SR R squared. But that's going to be the same thing as RS R squared. Which I didn't calculate that over there, but you can check that that's exactly the same coset using like the rules of commutativity for dihedral groups. But this is going to be the same thing as r, r squared, and then s, r squared. But that's exactly what is needed for commutativity. Okay, so we've got a commutative group with four elements. And then furthermore, those four elements all have order two. So I think it's pretty clear that R has order two and S has order two, but since we have commutativity, SR also has order two. That's because if you multiply it to itself, the commutativity takes over and you'll get S squared and R squared. I mean, of course, associated to those cosets. Maybe to be really careful, we would write them with the bars over. So if we wanted to make a Cayley table, it would look something like this. Let's put E bar here, R bar, S bar, and then S R bar. And then we'll do the same thing down here. And then filling this in is not much of an issue. You just do all of the required calculations. And what you'll see is that everything squares to the identity. So you get this identity element on the diagonal. And then you really only have to calculate half of everything because you have commutativity. So this is SR here. This will be S here because R bar and R bar is equal to the identity. Likewise, this will be SR here. And this down here will be S. And then finally, S with SR will give us R and R. So we've got something like that. But if you look closely at this and think about all of the groups of order four that you know, you might see that this looks a little bit like Z2 cross Z2. And actually, we could set up a fairly simple isomorphism between our quotient group and uh, Z2 cross Z2. And what it does is it'll take R bar to to the element one zero, and it'll take S bar to the element zero one. But since R bar and S bar will generate D four mod R squared, then that's sort of enough. But maybe we could write over here that sort of, of course, E bar will be mapped to zero zero, and then S R bar will be mapped to one one. So we get something like that. And now, as we did before, we'd like to describe this quotient group in terms of the symmetries of some sort of tweaked square. But notice in this case, we're left with a rotation that squares to the identity. So that rotation that squares to the identity would be like a 180 degree rotation. And then we're also left with a reflection. So you want something that has 180 degree rotation and then two reflections. Notice this and this would both be reflections. And I think maybe a nice picture to get that going is like the one that we had before, but instead of having two circles on each diagonal, we'll have a single circle on each diagonal. Now notice you can clearly rotate that by 180 degrees and end up back where you started, but you also have a nice symmetry across this diagonal as well as that diagonal. So those are your reflection symmetries. Okay, so we're going to end with one very important counterexample, and then I'll leave you with some warm-ups. Now we're going to look at a very important example, and that is that the normality condition for subgroups is not transitive. So that means we should be able to find a string of subgroups, K is a subgroup of H, which is a subgroup of G, where K is normal in H, H is normal in G, but K is not normal in G. So we can have a quick example of this. So you can check that the cyclic subgroup generated by S, 
is a normal subgroup of this subgroup that's generated by S and R squared inside of D4. So we looked at this subgroup before and we showed that it was normal. So I've got that over here. But I'll maybe leave it as a homework exercise to finish off showing that this one is normal. So that means we've got our setup right here, but then the cyclic subgroup generated by S is not normal in D4. And we can easily check that by looking at the coset associated with R. So notice that's going to give us, let's see, R and then RS. But that's not equal to the coset R and SR. And that's because we don't have commutativity. RS is not equal to SR. But this set right here is exactly equal to the right coset um, corresponding to R. So let's see, we've got this left coset is not equal to this right coset. And while that's not the way that we've been checking things were normal, by this over here, that is equivalent to having a normal subgroup or not having a normal subgroup. So that shows that this is not a normal subgroup, and thus we do not have transitivity. Now I'm going to leave you with some warm-ups. Here are three warm-up exercises based on what we saw. The first is a real classic one that we'll use time and time again to quickly show something as a normal subgroup. In fact, we could have used it to show that it's a normal subgroup a few times today. And that is, if you have a subgroup H of G where the index of H in G is equal to 2, then H is automatically normal. And in that case, you can actually immediately know what the isomorphism class of G mod H is. And by the isomorphism class, I mean the like well-known group that this is isomorphic to. And now next up, let's view the cyclic subgroup generated by 5 and the cyclic subgroup generated by 15 as subgroups of the group of additive integers. And then let's show that the quotient of these two groups is isomorphic to Z3. Then next, let's find all normal subgroups of Q8, that's the quaternion group, and determine the isomorphism class of the corresponding quotient groups. And that's a good place to stop.